Welcome to the eighth session in our series on crisis management for business leaders. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our platinum sponsor, Standard Bank, for your generous support of this webinar series. We are very grateful to you. Today we leave HBS in Boston and we go across the Charles River over to the Cambridge side of the river. And we are very grateful to Professor David Wilkins for approaching us about a collaboration on the legal issues associated with COVID-19 in Africa. Um, I have known David for um, uh, more years than I can count. He was at Harvard Law School when I was a student there. He has been there since 1986. David has a long list of accolades and awards, but today he is flying particularly high off of a very important one that occurred just last week. Harvard Law School has almost 400 faculty members and every year one faculty member is singled out as the, is in essence, teacher of the year. This year, the students of Harvard Law School voted David as the top professor at Harvard Law School, not a small matter. And he received this accolade based not only on his tremendous command of the law, but going above and beyond in mentoring young people, contributing to the student experience, and making sure that diversity is an important matter that is always looked at at Harvard Law School. In addition to that, David has been a key person in creating what is called the Celebration of Black Alumni, which is an every five-year event at Harvard Law School, which brings together people from across the diaspora. All of the members of the Harvard alumni from Africa come back to this event, as well as the Black alumni from the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. This has been the largest gathering of Harvard Law School's alumni of any color, and it's all because of David. Eric Holder made history alongside President Obama when Eric was appointed by President Obama as the first black attorney general in the United States. Among other matters that are important to our people, he focused during his tenure on voter rights, ensuring that each American has the right to vote, something that should be taken for granted, but is not something that we can assume for black people in the United States. Eric aggressively pursued voting rights during his tenure as Attorney General and continues to be active in aggressively pursuing this right today. I first met Eric about three years ago when he was on his way to a trip to South Africa um, on business for Covington and he indicated that while he was going to be on a business trip he wanted very much to be engaged in the human rights space in South Africa and with the help of one of our speakers today Tandi Orlean the head of the Legal Resources Center in South Africa we were able to put him together with a number of, in particular, young and rising human rights activists in, the, um, in South Africa. And it was very important for him to inspire them and to help them see that human rights is not just a post-apartheid issue in South Africa, but to see human rights through a global lens, and in particular, a U.S. issue, which is especially apparent today as he is being called on today to advise many parties through the extraordinarily complex set of human and civil rights issues that are following the tragic and senseless murder last week of George Floyd in the United States. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to David, and I'd like to thank you, David, for creating today's webinar, for defining the, address, the issues that need to be addressed, and for bringing together this group of extraordinary legal talent from across the continent to explore how business people can work with lawyers to address Africa's COVID-19 business, legal, and civil society issues. Once again, I'd like to thank you, David, for um, suggesting that we go forward with this topic and for assembling such a wonderful group of esteemed experts in law across the continent of Africa. David, it's your show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa, for that overly generous introduction. Uh, thanks to the amazing panelists that we have assembled today here. And thank you to the audience of incredible uh, lawyers, leaders, policy makers, business leaders uh, from across Africa and around the world. Uh, I just want to say a few words about why we chose or I asked Teresa to do this session and she generously agreed, and then a little bit about how we're going to proceed. So this uh, session is called Law and Crisis Management, and it's about working with lawyers in business, government, and society to manage the challenges of COVID-19 and beyond. The first question is why focus on law and lawyers? The obvious answer is uh, because everyone must comply with the law. But law must be about more than just constraint. To be sure, law plays a critical role 
in protecting individual liberties and human rights, both of which are particularly important during these times of crisis. But law also plays a crucial role in empowering individuals, organizations, and governments to develop creative solutions to society's problems. The tensions between these two faces of law, law on the one hand as constraint and on the other hand as creative problem solving, are heightened during times of crisis. Yet it is exactly in such times that we need to, lawyers to work collaboratively with leaders in business, in government, and civil society to further both of these vital aspects of the rule of law. Now, we tend to think of lawyers as technical experts in the law who advocate for their clients. And of course, this is part of what lawyers do. But lawyers must also be wise counselors who help their clients make decisions that are not only legal, yes, they must be legal, but also help them make decisions that are right. Ironically, this role is particularly important for business lawyers who must help their corporate clients create the kind of just and sustainable society that in the last analysis is essential for every business to prosper and grow. Finally, lawyers must also be leaders who play a critical role in leading key organizations in business, government, and society. In Africa, there is a long list of lawyer leaders who exemplify this tradition, including, of course, Nelson Mandela. In Africa today, it is more important than ever that lawyers in government, business, and society play all three of these critical roles. Notwithstanding the current crisis, I am convinced, and I know everyone in this webinar is too, that Africa stands at the precipice of an unprecedented period of growth. To single out only one important development, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is about to go into effect and will create a market of more than 1.3 billion people, more than half of whom are under the age of 25. The power of this market will redefine the global balance of power in the middle decades of the 21st century. At the same time, as we heard last week, Africa is, incre is increasingly a hub of innovation as both domestic and global players seek to address problems of development, sustainability, inequality, diversity, and generational change that yes, while affecting Africa, are increasingly being felt in every region of the world. But in order for this potential to be realized, African countries must continue to develop the kind of stable, transparent, and accountable legal structures that allow them to compete at a global level while preserving their own uniquely African norms and practices. The project on globalization lawyers and emerging economies that I lead is designed to look at these questions. Uh, these are not, of course, issues unique to Africa. Since the 1990s, many countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa have attempted to move themselves from poverty to prosperity. For many of these countries, this has been a movement from a more or less closed economic system to one that is more or less open to the global economy, which has in turn created rapid increases in foreign direct investment, and the privatization of many, but of course not all, state-owned institutions. This has in turn created a need for new laws and legal institutions to spur and regulate these markets and to interface between the domestic and the global economy. With these new laws has come the need for lawyers capable of operating within these new legal systems and interfacing with everything from global companies to the institutions of global governance. 
The GLEE project studies these new lawyers and explores how they in turn are reshaping the legal professions and the political economies of these rising powers and increasingly the global legal, political, and economic system generally. We began looking at what you might think of as the traditional BRICS countries, uh, India, Brazil, and China. And we wrote a book, as you will see, on each one of these, which you can, uh, are available at Amazon.com. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is we are now moving this project to Africa. And as some of the, those panelists on the call, as well as some of you in the audience knows, over the last year and a half or so, we've been uh, hosting a series of introductory events with major leaders in Africa, in South Africa, and Rwanda, and Kenya to begin this important work. As part of this project, we're investigating the role that lawyers play in responding to crises and promoting development in four critical areas, protecting individual rights and enhancing political accountability, providing access to justice, promoting economic development, and preserving sovereignty by building capacity in international institutions. The COVID crisis is underscoring the importance of all four of these areas. In the area of rights, for example, we have issues around testing the legality and enforcement of lockdowns and curfews or balancing privacy and public health. In the area of access, how do we ensure the fair distribution of government benefits and support, particularly for those in the informal economy, as we heard in the brilliant webinar earlier in this series? How do we protect women and vulnerable populations against domestic violence and discrimination when the courts are closed? Also a focus of another in this brilliant series. In the area of economic development, how do we help businesses and governments work collaboratively to develop navigate and enforce sensible regulatory policies? And how do we account for the interests of all stakeholders, employees, suppliers, and the community as a whole, as well as just shareholders and owners? And last but certainly not least, in the area of global governance, how do we promote regional and continent-wide cooperation for what is, after all, no single country's problem. While working with organizations like the World Bank and the WTO and other global developmental and governance organizations to ensure that Africa's interests are respected and protected. Today's program, as you see, tries to tackle this very large and complex, and I would argue largely unexplored piece of the puzzle. And we were therefore thrilled that so many top leaders have agreed to participate and to help us to begin this important dialogue. We've divided the program into two parts. Uh, in part one, uh, we will lead off with former Attorney General Holder, whose career uh, brilliantly exemplifies the issues we want to talk about, and my colleague, the wonderful Professor Ruth Akedeji, both of whom will give brief remarks looking at this from a kind of global perspective and an African perspective on the importance of law and lawyers. I'll then have a discussion with Secretary General Mihaly, from the Africa Development Bank about how the bank is thinking about these issues. We'll then move to part two, where we have a panel discussion with seven leading lawyers from all across Africa and around the profession, profession each of whom will offer a specific observation about the role of lawyers from their own unique vantage point, with the goal being that in total, all of these portraits will provide a comprehensive introduction to this important topic. Now, again, we have a very full program. So in order to ensure that we hear from all of our terrific speakers and have time for your questions at the end, 
we have all agreed to abide by strict time limits. And these limits will be strictly enforced by our wonderful research fellow at the Center on the Legal Profession, Raf Madalate from South Africa, who we have designated as, quote, the voice of God, uh, to politely but firmly interject if speakers know if they have gone past their allotted time. And Ralph, can you just uh, appear and say what you're going to say if time has expired? Yes, I will say uh, thank you for the insightful comment, but we have to move on to the next participant. We don't mean to be rude. We want all the voices in the conversations. But please remember, this is the beginning, not the end of the discussion. And I'll say a few words about how we intend to continue it at the end of this webinar. Finally, all of these magnificent speakers have agreed that I could give them the very shortest of introductions, allowing you to read their extensive bios posted online. So in that spirit, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Holder, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America, currently a senior partner at the prestigious law firm of Covington and Burling. And I am deeply honored to say my friend of many years, uh, whose own career, as I say, embodies the public role of lawyers about which he will now speak. So please, Mr. Attorney General. Well, thank you, David. Thank you all very much. And to everyone uh, joining us from across the world, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. And I guess to some of you on the webinar, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Now, I'm with you today to discuss the role that lawyers can play during times of crisis. The crisis that this group has focused on for several months and which we will cover today is, is COVID-19, whose ramifications will be with us for, for many years. But there is in, in my country today another crisis that I feel I must also speak at least briefly to, and that is the treatment in America of people of color by law enforcement. Now, both of these crises have, have disparately affected the black community in the United States. According to our Centers for Disease Control, data suggests that a disproportionate amount of COVID-19 illness and death among racial and ethnic minority groups with an overrepresentation of black Americans among hospitalized patients. Now, in New York, for example, the death rate among African Americans is about twice what it is for whites. These differences are undoubtedly due to the existence of conditions that make access to healthcare more difficult for people of color, and economic conditions that lead to the formation of underlying health conditions that make black people more vulnerable to the virus. Now these economic and social conditions that keep our African American community vulnerable are not new. They are remnants of a history of slavery, subjugation, and discrimination against African Americans. And they are present also in other crises that we are witnessing today the broken relationship between police and African-Americans. Now, what we are witnessing today is not new. Our history is replete with examples of black people being mistreated in the American criminal justice system. This, this helps to explain the intensity today of the movement within my country determined to finally eliminate the disparate treatment that too many of America's citizens have experienced for far too long. But the issues that we must confront are not unique to the United States. And in this regard, there's much we can learn from our brothers and sisters in Africa and much that we most, must, both must share. The African continent has dealt and, and is dealing with its own share of ethnic and racial strife, disparate treatment, and it teaches us important lessons about how to heal, how to rebuild, and how to transition to a more peaceful and just future. Now, I wanna to focus today on the very special role and I think the unique responsibility that lawyers have in times of crisis. As lawyers, we are endowed with systemic abilities and tasked with special responsibilities to improve the human condition by using the rule of law. It doesn't matter where we work or what kind of law we practice, each of us must find ways to contribute to the public good. Now, at Covington and Burling, the private firm where I now practice, I have the opportunity to work with several young lawyers in attempts to reform my country's electoral processes and in trying to ensure that the present administration acts in ways consistent with our laws and best traditions. <laughs> our work is, to say the least, challenging. We've also helped the private sector play its part by improving workplace cultures in need of repair. 
To this end, my colleagues and I made a number of recommendations to Uber in a public report to help the company address gender discrimination in the workplace. Other companies like Starbucks and Airbnb have engaged my firm to address issues of racial discrimination. Now, these companies have recognized their own obligation in addressing societal ills and have made their reckoning public, trying to transparently affect change from within. Now, these are examples of lawyers helping private entities deal with crisis situations that have a widespread public impact. We're also working for change in Africa as well, through our pro bono counsel to a, a teaching hospital in Burundi, a leadership training program in Liberia and Ghana, and a UN-led initiative that will create health and economic messaging platform that will reach up to 600 million people across the continent. Now, I am personally proud to be counted among the African diaspora. The continent, West Africa, is my ancestral home. The work you all do for the continent is of special and emotional importance to me, and not only because I was proud to serve alongside America's first African president, or proud to be its first African-American attorney general, I also join with you in celebrating Africa's success because I recognize that the fate of America is intertwined with each of yours. I saw that directly because I had the good fortune of traveling in Africa during my tenure as attorney general, working on businesses and issues ranging from governance in the rule of law, to economic development, to anti-terrorism, and transnational crime. Now, my experience on the continent has led me to believe that, contrary to what some might think, America is not the past, and Africa is the future. At Covington, I was part of a team of lawyers and advisors from our, our Africa practice group to represent MTN, a South African-based telecommunications company, working with the company and the Nigerian government to reach a settlement of a significant dispute we demonstrated to, I think, to an international audience that commercial disputes in Africa, in Nigeria, could be resolved transparently, equitably, and in a timely fashion. Now, although we may be situated in various places and in various parts of the professions, lawyers must never allow our moral compass to waver. We should speak up whenever we see injustice or a societal need, such as the case now with COVID-19. This pandemic is much more than a health crisis Though millions will be sickened and too many will die, the virus brings with it other societal ramifications. The economies of the affected nations, including my own, have been greatly and negatively impacted. Around the world, many are without employment. Many are without sufficient food. Many face the threat of homelessness. In mobilizing the resources of national governments and international organizations to respond to this unprecedented crisis, lawyers must play a significant role. With the unique training that we possess and the systemic understanding that we possess, attorneys must step to the fore and help to organize and to lead the response to the pandemic. Lawyers must reach across borders and oceans to craft solutions to support relief efforts and to push governments to aid those people in the greatest need. With governments in this era being, I believe, unnecessarily antagonistic, it falls upon those of us in the private sector to fill gaps that should not but do exist. Lawyers reaching out to colleagues in other countries are uniquely situated to lead in this effort. No matter where we are, we must find our own way to build. None of us can afford to be uninvolved in this time of crisis. We must come to the forefront of the fight and use our unique legal talents to affect change. Silence and inaction by lawyers too often has led to dangerous life-altering complacency. Never forget, Positive change, though possible, is not promised. It is the result of hard work, sacrifice, and endurance in the face of failure. We must commit ourselves to making, making real the opportunities that are the birthright of every American, every human being. In the absence of governments committed to global problem solving and the protection of the world's people, lawyers must step up, act, and be heard. We must start conjoined grassroots movements to affect the change that we want to see. Now, there are numerous scientific efforts underway to eradicate COVID-19. Lawyers must support those efforts and ensure that the life-saving medicines are ultimately distributed in an equitable and expedient way. We cannot allow the inequalities of the past to dictate the parameters of a healthy future. And lawyers like those in medicine must prescribe just treats to those now suffering by ensuring that adequate resources are 
expanded, protecting our most valuable resource, our people. Lawyers possess disproportionate amounts of power. In this critical time, that power must be used wisely and used for the maximum good. I am confident that working together and across borders, now rendered almost artificial, we can pave the way for a healthy present and a just future. I look forward to working with you all in this great endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General, uh, for those inspiring words. Uh, we're next going to go to my colleague, Ruth Okedeji, uh, who will uh, put some of the issues we've been talking about in a particularly African con context. Many of you know Ruth, who's been working across the continent and is one of the foremost experts on intellectual property from the perspective of Africa and other developing nations. Professor Okedeji, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Wilkins. Um, let me just say welcome to everyone and, and I express my thanks to Professor Wilkins, who I refer to um, as Professor Wilkins because he was in fact um, my professor. So um, the title is apt. Let me also say thank you to uh, the Attorney General, Mr. Holder for those remarks. Um, I will be referencing some of the themes the Attorney General laid before us as I speak uh, this morning um, about, or this evening, depending where you are, on law and crisis management. In about the year 2011, over 25 million Africans were living with um, HIV. And out of the 34 million HIV positive people in the world today, 69% of those live in Sub-Saharan Africa. And there are roughly about 23.8 million people still infected in all of Africa today. We are facing a new pandemic. Um, and I dare say that the only reason we did not refer to the HIV epidemic as a pandemic is because of the disproportionate impact that it had in the global south in particular. While the impact of the disease itself was horrific all over the world, um, Africa bore much of the brunt of this with dead bodies literally being carried away, entire families being wiped out. And in that process, the role of law was critical in preventing access to essential life-saving medicines. Many of you who are listening and participating in this webinar today will recall the bold act of the South African government in declaring that generic versions of the um, antiretrovirals that were so desperately needed to save lives would be permitted to be manufactured and sold and bought um, in South Africa. And at that time that the announcement was made, intellectual property owners from Europe and the United States began to cry that this was a violation of their patent rights um, in these life-saving pharmaceuticals. There were calls about the fact that many Africans would not be able to use these drugs as appropriate um, and would therefore cause the virus to mutate. This was in spite of the fact that 91% of the world's um, HIV positive children live in Africa and every year more than a million Africans die from HIV AIDS. So what does the coronavirus pandemic suggest, not only about the role of lawyers and the role of law, but about intellectual property law in particular, and what does this look like on the African continent? In a time of legal uncertainty, uh, what are the questions that are facing legal practitioners and, and policymakers and business people? What are the challenges, both legal and societal and developmental, um, that the pandemic presents for the legal framework um, in African societies? And what does it say about the role of business people um, and businesses in this moment? Let me start with what I think is an important conclusion. Many um, business firms and, and, and traders, and I speak both of the informal and the formal economy in, in Africa, underestimate the power that their business decisions every day has on the nature of technology and the possibility that technology can be deployed to address some of the needs that are pressing, especially the developmental needs. 
And although innovations from Africa are abundant, few outside of the African continent, and I dare say few within many African countries, learn or hear of these innovations. And let me just say, for example, that as of today, there are over 192 innovations in Nigeria alone directed at COVID-19. South Africa has close to 90 innovations directed at COVID-19. And in this webinar just recently, we got to see many of the um, examples and the top examples of innovation that has been developed, designed, and being deployed within the sub-Saharan African space. So one of the things that COVID-19 has done is to underscore the importance of innovation and its deployment in societies that historically have been viewed and continue to be viewed as lacking the intellectual, the social, or the business capacity to deploy and utilize innovation for human welfare. Now, this is happening against a backdrop of deep distrust, at least politically, in government. The question of whether governments will respond to the needs and affect the kinds of laws and think about the nature of the laws necessary to continue to address the impact of COVID-19, not only in the workplace, but in the society at large. And you must remember, of course, that we are talking about societies where social distancing will seem for many, many to be an impossible or at least implausible task. Given the extended family situation, given the way in which our villages are organized, the idea that social distancing um, is going to be easily replacing norms that govern otherwise everyday African life um, is tough to think about. Now, in the context of the crisis, there's an opportunity, I believe, that should make 2020 and beyond different from 2000 and uh, 2011, up through 2011, where we had a crisis that essentially had no legal framework directed at its amelioration. There are three main IP protection frameworks that cover about 56% of the African population. There is not a single regional patent examination office. Uh, the process of obtaining patents in the continent is extremely challenging. And ultimately, many of the innovations that occur and that are deployed within the African landscape lack the kind of protection that is necessary to make business models actually scalable um, and, and meaningful within the continent. A few weeks ago, we saw the, the, the innovations that were uh, being judged within um, this webinar context. Not a single one of those innovators referred to the legal framework within which they were working. And when you look at what exists within the South African um, uh, landscape, there are few countries that have independent national offices that that in fact can address the needs of innovators. And so business lawyers and intellectual property lawyers need to begin to create collaborations that make it possible for the innovations that are addressing the pandemic and its effects much more meaningful to the average African innovator. The processes in the offices that exist within the African landscape is expensive. Um, patent licensing or filing fees, excuse me, range as high as $4,000, um, something that is completely out of reach. So when we talk about the lack of access to medicines, we need to begin to think about the lack of access even to the laws that would protect businesses that are invested in innovations in order to make sure that those innovations are, are available to the average citizen. And so although these innovations are plentiful, and although the US is lacking in tests that are cheap and accessible, and although there are evidences of tests that are efficacious and that are quick arising within the continent, it is hard to imagine innovations within the African space making their way into US markets for the benefit of African Americans and even the larger US population. And the question to that is why? Why is it 
that innovations that respond to the phenotypes and to the particular conditions of black and brown bodies are unable to make an impact in markets where uh, people of color so desperately need them and are affected by them. One of the new emerging community responses is, of course, partnerships, these public-private partnerships that are intended to help promote prevention of the disease. And there are a number of examples that I don't have the time to go into, but I wanted you to see that one of the great innovations that is occurring as a result of the pandemic um, are cross-border partnerships between various countries, sharing data, sharing um, important exchanges to help facilitate the prevention um, of the slide. Importantly, of course, you see in Kenya, for example, startups and entrepreneurs who are being aided by Microsoft to file the kinds of intellectual property interests that would be necessary to promote business development in scaling up these innovations. But businesses can do more than that. Businesses don't only have to depend on their property rights through patents or copyrights or trademarks or trade secrets. There are in fact ways that businesses have begun to rally around innovation spaces. An example is the Open COVID Pledge, which is a pledge to make available innovation um, protected by IP, mainly in the United States, free for research. Now, when we look across the African landscape, the framework for facilitating access even to this research is, of course, quite limited. So, for example, the diagnostics innovations that we saw um, highlighted on this webinar a few weeks ago, um, most of these innovators do not have access to the terms of the COVID pledge, um, are not able to access the research that might in fact enhance the platforms that are being used and deployed within the African landscape. One key thing that has been quite different um, within the African landscape that we see today is the lack of business engagement in adopting innovation that has been created within the African landscape and helping to not only scale them, but to deploy them meaningfully. Much of what happens in the innovation space, including in the COVID-19 innovation space, has been because governments and businesses and lawyers have come together to think about ways in which access to the research and access to innovation and access to the end result of that innovation have been made available. The medicines patent pool, we see this as a result, of course, of the HIV crisis, but again, um, an example of ways in which legal frameworks and businesses have collaborated to permit the production of technologies, in this case, patented medications, to help low and middle income countries accessible um, um, access and make affordable the treatment of health technologies. And for COVID-19, of course, now the Medicines Patent Pool uh, offers the possibility that there might be an opportunity to contribute to the global response uh, to COVID-19. We already see that the Medicines Patent Pool is in use throughout Africa for TB, for HIV, and for hepatitis C. We see the collaboration of the World Health Organization launching a product pool to collect um, uh, patent rights, to, to, to to look at regulatory test data and lots of other things in order to make sure that these goods are available to address the needs of the most vulnerable in our populations. Now note that big pharma, many CEOs, many businesses are pushing back on this, concerned about the elimination of the economic incentives that generate the income to run their businesses. And so the idea of collaboration and the, the need for new business models revolves around the regulatory frameworks that exist in the country and in the continent. But as I said earlier, we do not have a regional patent office. We don't have patent office that examine uh, many of these innovations. We don't have our own innovators having access to overseas markets to in fact expose their innovations in global markets. There are a number of gaps that businesses and lawyers must pay attention to. And I am particularly concerned about these gaps um, because as we now know, many of the innovations that are, that are being rolled out both in Africa um, and in many, many uh, villages within countries involve the collection of data. Only 24 African countries currently are dealing with data protection. 
Many countries, because they are motivated by a desire for foreign investors, are not protecting local data. And the protection of personal data within the African landscape has been quite low, although the numbers are slowly rising. I have put on the slide in front of you South Africa, which in 2013 signed its Protection of Personal Information Act into law. Um, impressive beginning, but of course does not require companies to get consent from the data subject before processing that data. A central test for businesses and for lawyers will be how these new regulatory regimes will scrutinize and in fact hold private firms accountable for the use of personal data. Let me also say that there's a lack of effective privacy law protection. There's a lack of training. I did a survey of law schools across the continent, courses in privacy law, the training of, of, of businesses about how to handle personal data in the collection of data, again, sorely lacking. But of course, there are examples that show that at different stages, there will be lots of infection in COVID-19 unless we have containment measures. And those containment measures must be built around effective legal frameworks. It's important to remember that there are enhanced social protection systems, not only privacy laws and data protection laws and intellectual property laws, but the possibilities of collaborations between businesses and government in thinking about the frameworks that both enhance the protection of domestic innovation and make possible the introduction of African innovations into the global landscape to address the way this disease in particular affects black and brown people, not only in Africa, but also around the world. It's time to change the narrative that black and brown people on the continent do not have the intellectual capacity to innovate to address the most pressing problems that face human society, not only on the continent, but around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth, for those brilliant remarks. Uh, as all of you know, the slides will be made available and her slides are just filled with incredibly important and useful information for everyone on this webinar. Uh, I'd now like to turn to a very special guest who's really taken time out of his extraordinarily busy schedule to be with us today, Secretary General Vincent O. Miheli of the Africa Development Bank. Um, Secretary General Mihaly has agreed uh, to just uh, engage with me in a very short dialogue about how the bank is thinking about the role of law, lawyers, legal innovation, and the way in which we've been speaking, both in its direct response to COVID-19 and more generally in its development strategy moving forward. And so, Mr. Secretary General, I'd like to just start by just asking that question. How is the bank thinking about law and legal reform in terms of uh, helping African governments craft effective solutions to the COVID-19 problem? Now, I will answer your question, but let me give you a little background about the bank so that those who are watching will know um, a bit about the bank. The bank was established in 1964. Currently has 81 members. 54, 54 of those are African countries, while 27 are non-African countries. Now, of course, Ireland is the latest member of the bank and joined the bank effectively on the 24th of, of March 2020. Now, having said that also, it is important for me to contextualize the development priorities of the bank so that when we do our answers, you will get a whole um, 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 picture. The bank has what it refers to as the high fives. Just think about the high five. And the high fives are the development priorities of the bank. Number one is light up and power Africa in terms of energy, electricity. The second is feed Africa, which is agriculture and the need to be uh, self-sufficient in food production. And the third is industrialize Africa. Of course, you've talked about the continental free trade agreement. And the fourth is integrate Africa in terms of African integration of which the continental free trade is one aspect of it. And finally, you have what is referred to as improving the quality of life of 
ordinary Africans. So having said that context, I think it, I can now answer your question. Your question to me is how is the bank thinking about law and legal reform in creating effective policies to respond to the COVID-19 crisis? Now, let me, let me contextualize this. The bank has always believed that law and by extension lawyers have vitally essential role to play in the development process, particularly in Africa because of the fragility of several African countries and economies. But let me also observe that the bank does not necessarily engage or prescribe to borrowing member countries what to do generally with regard to law reform because it is not an area of the bank's competitive advantage. However, it does encourage member countries to deal with those legal gaps and bottlenecks. Ruth talks, talked about the issues around um, um, legal gaps. And those gaps have impact in the country's abilities to implement development projects or programs in a legally sound manner. Now, in, in the course of dealing with the COVID pandemic, in early April, the bank approved what it calls the COVID-19 Rapid Response Facility for African countries, up to $10 billion. And within that approval process, you find that most of that will go to what we call the Program-Based Operations or PBOs, which is generally but budget support. And budget support to deal with the socioeconomic and the health issues arising from, from, from the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Now, within that framework of the budget support, we have what we refer to as policy dialogues with countries. In other words, that presents an opportunity for the bank to engage with these countries in the areas where there needs to be some bit of reform, and some of which implicate legal aspects of what the bank does. Now, I'll just zero in on one, one critical area, apart from financial management, debt management, we've discovered, the bank has discovered that for the COVID situation, one prominent area where reform is needed because of lack of preparedness is the area of social protection and social safety nets. Why is that the case? Because 80% of the African economy is in formal sector. And so what do you do under such a circumstance? A woman selling fruits in the market, you tell her not to come to work, she's locked down, there's no provision whatsoever. So governments need to be able to reform their, their systems, their laws, their regulations, and their health policies to be able to cater for these poor, vulnerable people on the continent. So that is, that is one area we, 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 we focus. But let me zero in also specifically to cater to the legal capacity of African countries to deal with issues around law reforms or tackle complex legal matters. The bank, midwife, the process of establishing what we refer to as the African Legal Support Facility. And the African Legal Support Facility has the mandate to assist African countries provide legal support in negotiating and even writing laws in those complex areas where Africa is, 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 is a bit lacking. For example, you'll find that a number of countries in their mining projects enter into agreements that they're very difficult getting out and the negotiating those agreements. The legal support facility is therefore very vital in the legal reform work that the bank does because the bank uses such kind of instrument to support member states. And also let me say that for COVID-19, we come to the realization that the work of the African Legal Support Facility is more apt now because of the legal pressures on a number of African countries to engage in a number of um, contracts and uh, negotiations and transactions. So within that framework, definitely the bank has been able to afford member countries an opportunity to deal with those gaps and bottlenecks that exists that may help in dealing with even the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I think in that brilliant and comprehensive answer, you really a a answered all the questions that I had. So in the interest of time, what I think I will do now is uh, as members of this uh, webinar series know, one of it, the, its distinguishing features is that we poll the audience uh, on important questions that we can then pass along to policymakers because we have an extraordinary group of people. We're now going to turn to the second part of the program, which is a really extraordinary panel discussion of seven of the most thoughtful and influential lawyers uh, that I know, uh, both across Africa, but also globally, and uh, across many different parts of the profession. As I said, the goal here is for each person to give us their views on a piece of the problem, which we hope will then overall give us a comprehensive introduction. Uh, so I'm going to start, and, and by the way, consistent with what I said before, as I ask the questions, I will give these extraordinary people just the briefest introduction so we can spend the time hearing from each of them. Uh, I'm going to start with Stephen Chege. Stephen is uh, the Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Safaricom, the General Counsel as part of his responsibility, but I think... Uh, 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 indicating the role of lawyers in important African companies. He's more than just in charge of the legal department. Um, and as many of you know, Safaricom is really an extraordinary company that exists at the intersection of banking, telecom, and technology. And therefore, it has a very unique perspective on both the challenges, but also the opportunity of using the kinds of innovation uh, that Professor Okediji spoke about with respect to the COVID-19 crisis. Impesa is the world's leader with respect to uh, mobile banking uh, in the world. So Stephen, here's my question to you. Um, it, the COVID crisis really uh, is posing a particular challenge and that challenge, uh, as I think Ruth also said, cannot be resolved either by governments alone or by private sector companies. So how does a company like Safaricom uh, think about its role in helping to solve this critical crisis uh, and building a new Africa moving forward? And what role are you playing as, again, not only the chief legal officer, but also a, a major person in the uh, corporate hierarchy altogether in uh, driving this uh, strategy forward. If I can just give a bit of background on Safaricom for those who may not uh, know Safaricom, we are essentially a mobile communication uh, company uh, in, in Kenya. And we currently serve 36 million customers. Uh, our market capitalization is around $11 billion. And we just provide the usual things that uh, companies tend to provide for, for their customers in this, uh, uh, in this industry. However, we'll go back to what uh, Attorney General uh, Eric Holder said. As a company, we're very keenly aware about where we want to be. His words were, companies must know their position in society or a community. That is uh, one thing that Safari prides itself in, in in having a very good barometer of our nexus between ourselves and our customers and our country. Um, as uh, David mentioned, Safaricom manages the M-Pesa platform. M-Pesa is one of those innovations that Professor Ruth spoke about that are invented, uh, uh, that come to life in Africa. And Kenya's uh, version of M-Pesa is actually the leading one. Uh, in the world. Uh, we have over 24 million people uh, using M-Pesa as a service and transacting well over $30 million every day. So this is money that they're able to move for payments, um, for you know, paying your hospital bills, your medical bills, any transaction you can save, you can borrow using M-Pesa. And it's a powerful platform and it is, uh, we believe it is homegrown and it has succeeded uh, exceptionally well uh, 
uh, in our environment. Um, so, so that's a bit about Safaricom, but what we tend to say at Safaricom is that we are a purpose-driven organization and we exist to transform lives. That is central to how we see ourselves in the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It just means that as a company that has this opportunity to be the largest organization in East Africa, more is expected of us and it is up to us as a company to step up and do a number of things to help out. So how are we looking up, uh, at this? During this pandemic, government has a heavy weight on its shoulders. And because of that, a lot of help is needed from companies like ourselves or everyone else to make things work. Uh, an example I could give is the first reaction that most governments have responded to COVID-19 is a lockdown, which means people are not able to go to work and children are not able to go to school. As an organization that provides internet services, what we did in response to this is double the capacity of all the fixed line uh, bandwidth for all our customers for free. Why did we do this? Because we need to meet our customers at their point of need. They are not able to access their offices, but they still need to keep on running their businesses. And this is important uh, to help the whole um, uh, country go through this pandemic because as has been said, it is more than just a medical uh, problem. It's also an economic problem. So that's what we have done. <clears throat> Being a very regulated company, uh, you could imagine that's an easy thing to just uh, strike out and say, we're going to do this. However, from a legal and regulatory perspective, we have to look at what this means in terms of uh, providing a service which customers can rely on and which regulators can respect and say that uh, the services are being provided with the right kind of speeds. So for example, if you are on a bundle uh, or a package that had 10 Mbps, we doubled it to 20 Mbps and we're holding ourselves accountable to that. And actually this is information we are prepared to share with third parties. And we're also making a contribution to making sure that businesses that can run remotely um, can, can be able to run in sessions such as this one we're having here uh, today. Education, children cannot go to school, they still need to learn. And education is now being offered on online platforms. Again, uh, the giving access uh, to, to this has been important to ensure that parents are able to continue learning for their children. What we're doing is making sure that our economy is not slipping back during this time of the pandemic, and that when things go back to normal, which we all hope will be soon, they'll just be able to reconnect and pick it up and move forward from uh, where, we, <coughs> where we've left it. If I can speak about government, we have direct uh, PPPs with governments. We have um, provided call centers facilities where doctors can sit in 24 seven and provide support to all Kenyans on the COVID-19 pandemic. They're able to use our facilities for free. And this is another contribution that we've done. Now, getting such people to come and work in your presses, in your premises, lawyers will tell you this takes a lot of hoop jumping and it could lead to a lot of, you know, different kind of interesting things. But this is something we're prepared to do because of the greater good that uh, uh, we are aiming for. Because if we just assume the government will figure it out and sort it out by itself, we may have less information going to the right people and therefore not be able to contain or deal with this pandemic uh, as effectively as we can. Thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, oh, hopefully Steve. others will have a chance to, to ask you and question and answer. This is such an important topic and, and your company is so important in what it's uh, doing. Um, I then next though want to move to uh, Dr. Maima Bello Osage. Again, many of you will know uh, Maima as the co-founder of uh, one of the most important firms in all of Africa, Udo Udomo Bello Osage in Nigeria. Uh, we're also proud to say she's a proud graduate of the uh, Harvard Law School, and she has two daughters who have also attended uh, the law school. And Maima, what I'd like to ask you is, listening to Stephen and what he is trying to do with Safaricom uh, in response to the crisis as a corporate leader. Uh, what do you see as the role of great law firms like yours in facilitating this? That is, what is the role of lawyers in private practice on the continent uh, in helping both companies and governments 
develop effective responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks to you and to Africa.com for inviting me to join this session. Um, in the very limited time that we have available, I think my comments can only be extremely high level and pretty general, but I'm hoping that some of the detail can be picked up in the question and answer session. Um, in responding to the second part of your question in a way, David, I think it's important to recall what a couple of our previous speakers have addressed, which is the importance of the informal sector in the economies of many African countries. This is the sector that actually employs probably the most people. And it's the sector that is, has the greatest potential to develop the jobs that are required if the economies of Africa are going to revive from this current crisis and if they're going to survive and indeed if they're going to thrive. So it's quite important for business law firms which realize that it is the business of Africa that is going to make this continent grow to support these, this sector in the ways in which they support the corporate sector. And uh, as we go through, perhaps one can identify a couple of the things that are being done. But one of the things, for example, and uh, I, I should perhaps uh, apologize for promoting my law firm a little bit, but uh, Udo Domenbello Sage has set up a separate unit that actually seeks to transition the informal sector players to corporate sector players. It's one of the things that we think is very important. And it's a way of not just giving back to the country, but also mm -hmm. understanding that that is where our potential future clients will come from. Um, in terms of the support that is given to the corporate sector, of course, it cuts across everything. We have been providing legal advice, albeit remotely, across a wide range of disciplines. And I'd like to focus for a second on the fact that we're not just providing legal advice in this particular crisis situation. We're actually focused very much on providing wise counsel, hopefully wise counsel, but also um, uh, uh, sounding boards for, uh, uh, for um, corporates that are looking to seek a little uh, advice that is a little bit more detached and that it does not focus so much on emotion. A lot of boards are concerned about ensuring that they will not emerge from this crisis in a situation where there's any personal or corporate liability. So this is something that has been a bit different from the norm. We often find that as business lawyers, we are brought in towards the end of a situation rather than at the beginning. And many corporates are beginning to realize that there is value in bringing in their business lawyers to discuss issues as they proceed, rather than waiting till the transaction is pretty much set in stone before moving forward. So we are providing that level of wise counsel across a wide range of things. As far as legal advice is concerned, we're just providing absolutely everything that we normally provide. Um, and we're trying to provide it in the context of the importance of keeping all of the businesses that we speak to running in compliance with the laws and the uh, obligations that they have from the various regulatory bodies that they deal with. I won't go into detail because I suspect that my time will be running out pretty quickly. But again, it's something that we can perhaps pick up as we go through um, our question and answer session. But one thing I do want to respond to a little bit is that in providing all the advice that we are providing, we are actually quite focused on, and it has been a big concern to respond to one of Professor Okediji's points, that there are privacy issues that people are extremely concerned about. Um, there are also issues relating to data security and cybersecurity that we suspect are going to be increasingly important as we go through this crisis. And it's certainly an area of law that I think is going to generate a whole new set of law firms for the future. And that's going to be very interesting to see as well. I see Ralph looking at his uh, watch and therefore I will stop here and allow my uh, colleagues to participate and respond happily with questions and answers as they come forward. Maima, thank you very much as always, not only uh, perfectly said, but elegantly said in the time available. Let me uh, now move from the private sector uh, to lawyers uh, who are really deeply engaged in civil society. And we're very, very, very lucky to have two of the most thoughtful lawyers in that realm that I've had the, the privilege of meeting during my time in Africa. 
Uh, the first is Tandi Orlean, who's the chairperson of the Legal Resource Center Trust in South Africa. As many of you know, uh, it's not only South Africa's leading public interest organization, but really one of the leading ones around the world. Um, and because of her stature in that organization, Tandi is not just uh, a lawyer and the head of that organization, but is also uh, on several corporate boards and widely consulted. Uh, with members of both the governmental sector and the public sector uh, about the role of law in the informal economy for ordinary people in South Africa and beyond. And uh, Tandi, I would like to ask you, what role should lawyers be playing in protecting um, the interests of those most vulnerable in society? Uh, and how does someone like you in an organization like yours work to ensure that both, let's say, in your role as a corporate board member, in your role as influencing a government, and in the kinds of work that your lawyers do? Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Teresa and Africa.com for inviting me to this panel. As uh, has already been said, five minutes is such a short time. But I'm going to try and contextualize uh, my inputs here and looking from outside into the inside. Businesses have got a traditional objective that I believe has shifted in the last few years. And that traditional objective is to ensure shareholder value. So the most important thing even now uh, it's hard to ensure that businesses look beyond that. But in terms of where we are, in terms of where governance regimes are in governments, corporate governance, it's become very important that businesses look beyond shareholders and embrace a broader stakeholder perspective. I'm speaking from a public, public interest law perspective, I'm speaking from a perspective of the rule of law, which is embedded in a constitutional democracy. So it may not be applicable across the board, but maybe the experiences that we have may help people look at how law can be used as a tool to ensure that we not only meet this crisis that we are in, but look beyond the crisis. I'm not going to touch on what various speakers have dealt with, but to pick up on the interface and how that interface has got to be supported by law. Uh, within society, the interface is mainly between government and business, between business and its employees, as well as between business and the communities. And that is what I call the license to operate. So businesses have got to be very aware and make sure that their systems respond to these requirements of their license to operate in the countries. So what we have been looking at at the LRC, and I just must say that uh, those who don't know the LRC, uh, I'm sure will be able to follow us. Uh, we have a website lrc.org and also our group of lawyers who are very competent in various fields have looked at the areas that support people who are disadvantaged, people who don't have the right or who don't have the funds to represent themselves. So it's quite important to look at areas of negotiations in the first place so lawyers can advise and support their clients. The second issue that needs to take place is then to go into the value chain of the uh, dispute resolution process. That includes mediation, conciliation, and facilitation. However, everything is embedded within the statutes as well as the regulations. So it's very critical that uh, we look at those things. And in, in this critical time, the LRC has brought a number of cases to court, to the high courts of South Africa, to ensure that we can protect the rights of 
uh, the disadvantaged. We have not gone into cases against business because most of the issues during this period have been against government. However, David, in your introduction, you also referred to a cooperative relationship, not only an adversarial relationship. So it's quite important as lawyers advise the business and as we, particularly in a lot of the jurisdictions, are coming out of lockdown and businesses are going to be going full steam to try and manage the balance between health and the economy, that they look at all these areas. As I've indicated, and we've all said, the time frame is very short. I hope that we'll be able to engage time permitting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tandi, for those inspiring remarks. Uh, I now want to turn to someone else who's uh, working in the uh, informal sector, trying to bring law to ordinary Africans, but is working from a private context in which he's really marrying technology uh, and kind of broadening access to just the law to ordinary people. And that's Gerald Abila, who's the founder and executive director of Barefoot Law in Uganda. Um, Gerald, I wonder if you could say a few words about how you're trying to bring technology and kind of information about law uh, to people who desperately need access to government benefits or services or other sorts of legal protections in this time of crisis. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Honorable Attorney General Eric Holder for his wonderful opening remarks. To you, Professor David Wilkins, Harvard Law School and Africa.com for putting this together. And to everyone who is joining us today, it's indeed an honor for me to be here. Our situation right now is not a promise. The world, the world is unjust. More than 5.1 billion people face an injustice. And of these, about 1.5 billion have no remedy. To overcome this disservice to the world's people, especially the poorest and the most vulnerable, the law and justice must be made readily available to everyone. And through the innovative use of digital technology, this is Barefoot Law's mission, to make this available 50 million people across Africa by 2030. Like I said, the world is unjust. The COVID-19 crisis is going to make an unjust situation, a bad situation, even worse. What started out as a health crisis is going on to become an economic crisis, eventually a social crisis, and if not handled well, a rule of law crisis. Post-COVID, we're likely to see a drastic increase in the number of legal problems people are facing. The most prominent of these is domestic violence. We're likely to see issues of land, issues of unemployment rising. We're already seeing this in barefoot law. But to prevent this from happening, we need to creatively rethink our access to justice approach by leveraging innovation and digital technology. According to a report by the GSMA, about one billion people will have a SIM card connection in Africa by 2025. And this gives us a wonderful opportunity to make access to the law and justice available to everyone. We can use this to make data legal decisions from the data we've captured to scale the impact of our work. But in order for us to do this, we need new thinking across the board. For legal education, we need to start creating lawyers who know how to use technology lawyers who are open-minded towards new approaches of doing law, lawyers who have empathy now that we are going a lot digital. One example I've seen of where this happens well is at Strathmore Law School, and I think this can serve as a benchmark for the rest of Africa. There's a lot we can learn from that. Uh, the Honorable Attorney General, in his opening remarks, talked about creating lawyers who must never allow our moral compass. And I guess this is the role of law schools in the new normal. For lawyers in practice, we need to increase on our pro bono engagement. Bar associations need to encourage lawyers to engage in pro bono work while encouraging innovation. For courts, they need to act as facilitators to encourage alternative dispute resolution while even different technologies. For businesses, businesses have a fundamental role to play. Businesses through their partnership can help 
expand SDG 16 to enable a lot of these innovations to scale. Governments, the regulators, should come up with regulations that are designed to encourage and not to stifle this growth. But having said that, we need to guard ourselves against the unintended consequences. No one should be left behind because of their gender or their sex, or else we end up perpetuating a lot of existing inequalities. We need to guard against uh, data protection and privacy, especially now in the age of contact, apps, of contact tracing apps. Call me an idealist, David, but from a legal perspective, I believe everything will be okay when all people of Africa and the world are empowered to get ready access to the law and use this as a tool to protect ourselves, our families, and communities. Remember, the ultimate law is humanity. Thank you. Gerald, thank you so much. Uh, that is such an important lesson for us all to remember. And uh, for those, we'll provide information about all of our distinguished speakers, but I urge you to, to check out what Gerald is doing as a model for perhaps what could be do done in other places. Um, unfortunately, Michelle's technical problems cannot be solved. So unfortunately, we won't be able to hear from him. Uh, so I'm now going to uh, shift gears towards lawyers uh, who are operating at the highest level uh, in the non-governmental organization space uh, and, and ask them to think about what the role of law and lawyers is in that context. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Gottfried Penn, who's the general counsel of the Africa Development Bank. Uh, we already heard uh, the brilliant remarks of uh, Secretary General Miheli. Uh, but Gottfried, I'd like your perspective as the person, as the general counsel uh, of the bank, what are you looking for with respect to uh, the role of law and lawyers and how lawyers particularly uh, can facilitate the work of the bank because the bank is trying to do such important work in this area. What are you looking for from lawyers in the private sector, in the government sector, or, or in the nonprofit sector or public sector in order to work on, uh, help the bank work on these critical issues? Dr. Penn. Well, after my colleague uh, Vincent spoke, <laughs> it would be hard for me to, to say much, but in the world, in the MDB world, in the multilateral development bank world, we have two words that come up repetitively, which are competitive advantage and selectivity. So our shareholders provide us with uh, funds, but we have to use those funds uh, where our greatest comparative advantage lies, as well as we have to be selective in what we do. But that doesn't mean that in crisis situations like this, we fold our arms and do nothing. As my colleague uh, Vincent already highlighted earlier, most of the support that we are providing those during this uh, pandemic cr uh, crisis to uh, our member countries is aimed at uh, uh, stimulating their economies, both on the pri public and the private sector side. So we are looking for lawyers who can then take advantage of that, those type of financing mechanisms that we are providing to our shareholders to try to help them, particularly on the African continent, to uh, develop legal frameworks that can allow them to easily uh, deal with these types, uh, types of unforeseen situations. And one of the earliest things we noticed when, when the crisis just first arose is that uh, there is a shortage of medical equipment uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment and pharmaceuticals on the African continent. And there's no central network for procuring uh, uh, these types of equipment. So one of the things we are working on as a bank, and which may be interesting for lawyers across Africa to join us in, is trying to create a, a, a framework or to put together a framework uh, or a platform that would centralize the procurement of this type of equipment during the crisis uh, uh, and to supply it to different African countries so as we can go around the different uh, procurement regimes uh, that may in some cases be quite constraining for African, uh, uh, for African co continent. We are also looking at ways in which we can proactively look, uh, work with the, the, the local economies, with local economies to foster some of the areas where you can uh, 
uh, have productivity in Africa, like the production of masks locally, uh, the production of testing kits, and in this case, uh, uh, the Institute Pasteur based in Dakar has uh, produced uh, a testing kit that uh, in cooperation with a British firm, that is less costly than the test kits that you find elsewhere. So we are trying to collaborate with them and would encourage lawyers in Africa to look at ways of helping them to patent this so that it could be most effectively uh, distributed across African, uh, the African continent. As Maima said, uh, said uh, this is, it is important for lawyers during these uh, times to remember that uh, what is at stake is the survival of, the African, uh, of African businesses. And therefore, since we in the African Development Bank, by dint of uh, competitive advantage and selectivity, do not get directly involved in legal law and legal reform, we, we through our sister uh, organization, the African Legal Support Facility, uh, provide the financing to help uh, the uh, African governments and African lawyers to craft legal systems that go will look beyond this crisis and look at uh, developing Africa. Because as you yourself pointed out in your presentation, David, Africa is the next, uh, is at the precipice of uh, uh, major developments and would probably be the next frontier for the, the next new frontier for world development. I just end my remarks there, thank you. Dr. Penn, thank you so much for those important remarks and reminding us all of the context in which this is occurring. Ms. Okuro, thank you so much for taking time out. She's come just straight from a global committee meeting at the World Bank uh, to be here with us, some of the most senior leadership. So let me just ask you if you could just say a few words about how is the World Bank uh, approaching this problem and, and what particularly in your role as general counsel would you like to say to this incredible audience of several thousand lawyers and business and government leaders uh, throughout the African continent and the world? Um, I want to thank you for giving me this precious five minutes um, to answer this question. And I want to say hello to all the other marvelous speakers. I was able to hear you um, some of you, but not, I don't think, um, properly connected. And I want to say hello to my dear friend, Godfrey, GCs of the um, uh, of banks like ours. We are very tight and we talk about these things a lot. So it's nice to see you, Godfrey, as well. So let me just say something before I, I focus on the, uh, on the actual question. I just want to sort of give a few highlights um, because COVID-19 has had brutal, it has brutal um, uh, consequences. The human impact has been has been terrible, and it's continuing. And in some places, the the crisis has already hit the acute stage, and in others, it hasn't. And in Africa, um, it hasn't been hit as badly as other continents, um, but it probably hasn't yet got to the acute stage yet. So there's a bit of an unknown there. And the bank generally has been focusing um, in its COVID assistance for its member countries on um, a few things, public health and emergency responses, household resilience, business resilience, and social protection for vulnerable populations. Um, and as lawyers, we've also been focusing on the legal and regulatory issues that are arising from the pandemic. So there are a variety there, there are labor issues, employment issues that have been raised before, health and policy issues, there is uh, data privacy issues, very, very important, the contract tracing and everything else like that. Um, so we're on top of um, all of those things too. And for the continent of Africa in particular, it's already had a cocktail of shocks. It's had um, floods, cyclones, food crisis, locusts. It was one issue we were dealing with before COVID uh, struck, and of course, um, pre-COVID Ebola. Um, and although COVID is a one in a 100 year threat, it is really, um, hit um, the world and, and in particular the continent uh, of Africa in um, a number of ways. We would say that, that the health impacts can be managed in the continent of Africa. It's the economic impacts that are going to be challenging. And those challenges are from the health side, livelihoods, particularly in the informal sectors. Um, that it, it's difficult to, 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 to uh, identify and to manage and to um, uh, measure. Um, and of course, education, children's education, which was already something we were working 
uh, very hard as our member countries to improve will have been hit. Um, and again, in, in some places, the oil price shock, some uh, uh, countries on the African continent that rely on tourism, all of this. But one thing I do want to say, and it's a bit of a personal thing, is of course, gender-based violence will have increased here. And this is something that the bank has been looking at very closely, I feel very passionate about. And this is something that we must not forget in all of these things that I've listed that are the obvious, that the GBV uh, issues will have increased. And um, another thing as well that I think all of us as lawyers should be very aware of and that we should make sure does not um, stop in any way, does not lag behind, are some of the progress that needs to be made and needs to continue to be made in relation to giving uh, women um, uh, access to justice, uh, the rule of law, etc. Women um, have always uh, suffered um, and lag behind on everything. And post COVID, we don't want to make that worse. In fact, we want to use it as an opportunity to improve everything. So the bank's interventions have really been threefold. We focused on protecting uh, lives through financing, um, health and food uh, projects, livelihood, as I mentioned, supporting households and businesses and firms and protecting the future through working with our member countries on reforms and economic um, recovery. Um, but um, I want to stress, we work with our governments. We don't tell them what to do. We find out what they need and we work with them uh, to, to provide that. And technology is key. I've heard a number of speakers uh, talk about this already. Um, and it's key not just to, to, to deal with this crisis, but it's also key for education, um, transferring money through uh, mobile phone systems, as we've heard before, um, contact tracing, etc. If ever we knew what technology was for and why we have it now um, it's because of this crisis we would not have been able to do even us and the we in the bank would not have been able to do what we did in response to this COVID crisis of getting billions through the door to respond without the technology that allowed us to continue and that needs to be something we see across the continent of africa as well so we're working on all these different um grounds what i would say is no one size fit all i'm talking of africa as a country continent but of course it's separate countries and each country has a different need and we're working with each individual country to meet those individual needs as i like to say we are um we are all in the same storm but not necessarily in the same boat so tailoring is is um, very um important um and the solutions are there on the african continent the solutions are there that, uh, and we need to um, be there alongside and, and help our member countries in Africa reach their, reach their goals. And just as a reflection, one of the things that I would say, and I know my time is probably running out, um, but one of the things that I would say is that it's interesting to reflect on how countries have reacted to the crisis in different ways from a legal perspective. So some have used constitutions to declare um, con uh, an emergency, Ethiopia and Liberia. Um, others have placed reliance on existing legislation, like um, Burkina Faso, who relied on a public health legislation, and some have enacted new laws, um, such as Ghana. So it's interesting to see how different countries in Africa have reacted to the crisis. Um, and what we would say is as well that we have, we have seen is that countries um, in Africa have been very quick to um, address um, issues that affect businesses as well, so that they can um, they can you know we, we don't lose those uh, businesses in, as a result of the crisis. So a lots of modified tax um, uh, laws have been put in, for example, for example, in Cameroon's temporary tax relief, um, in Ghana, due date for filing corporate income tax has been delayed, things like that, to really ensure that the whole system as a whole um, uh, moves forward. Um, and um, many countries have introduced uh, laws to um, help with wage subsidies, etc. in Botswana, and there's a subsidy for citizens um, employed by businesses affected by COVID. So we've seen all of this. It kind of mirrors the things we're seeing elsewhere. But I think one of the things that we mustn't forget is the impact of what we see elsewhere will be magnified in country, in developing um, countries. And um, we, the bank and the lawyers in the bank and, and, and um, the same for um, Godfrey's team, we are here to ensure nothing falls through the gaps. 
and we are here to help work with our member countries as lawyers um, and as um, um, you know people who feel passionately about development that this does not push everything behind this not does not undo decades that are of success in development but in fact moves it forward because however bad this crisis is however bad this pandemic is however bad the brutal costs are of it we must learn from it so that the losses are not in vain and um, we need to be quick we need to be nimble and we need to identify the real areas but i would stress very much so we mustn't forget the women in all of this and we mustn't forget the rule of law and justice in all of this and this mustn't be left behind but enhanced so there's privacy issues those gbv issues those contract tape tracing issues etc etc there's getting um, businesses back up and addressing those issues we always knew were there in the informal economies are absolutely key going forward i see it about the future and um we need to we need to really learn lessons and move fast Thank you. Sandy, I, I cannot thank you enough for rushing here, for particularly for remarks that we could not have had better remarks to close the formal part of this program than those brilliant comments you just gave. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa. I think we, we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions. I, I Please forgive us, but I wanted you to see the full range of incredible uh, lawyers around the continent and around the world who are trying to think about how to tackle this problem. So Teresa, why don't I turn it over uh, to you? Thank you very much, David. Our first question comes from Ezra Davids. Ezra um, heads the corporate M&A practice at Bowman's Law Firm based out of Johannesburg. Um, we happen to have about 43 attorneys from Bowman's across the continent on this call today and so we thank you Ezra for raising your hand um, to get involved in this discussion. Thank you very much Teresa, thank you very much David for moderating this panel. Quick question, I know we're running short of time. Um, the common theme that seems to be emanating from the discussion is the need for collaboration between government, business and civil society and the role of lawyers within that particular construct. And along that vein, I would like to pose a question to the panelists, anyone can take it, which is um, the emerging pattern of government support for private businesses, whether that's justified or not. And to the extent that it is justified, what terms should be associated with that? Currently, to the extent that there are any terms or conditions associated with that, they tend to be limited to corporate action like restriction on buybacks, declaration of dividends, and in some instances, restrictions on M&A. Does, does the panel believe that there is room for more mandatory conditions with respect to contributions to developmental goals and the like? That's for the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra, for such an insightful question. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable to respond to that question. Firstly, uh, where I've got both feet, one representing communities and the other one in the boardrooms. It is very critical that the, there's a quid pro quo, that is there's a, a, a properly constituted obligation on the part of business in relation to this uh, to the support that the governments are providing. And that enables a more cohesive building of the society post COVID. One, as you indicate, there's going to be rebuilding of issues around the whole economy, are constructing some of the failing businesses. There's going to be issues of unemployment going forward. There's going to be a lot of issues that are going not only from a health perspective, but from a perspective where the whole society is being shifted backwards as it were. So uh, someone earlier on talked about how much this has impacted and we have not yet seen in Africa half of the impact that this COVID-19 is going to have. So it's critical that lawyers to their clients, people like you, Ezra, have got to ensure that there is an appreciation of that giving to, the, to ensure that their businesses are sustainable. 
but that needs to have a responsibility attached to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tandi. Um, we have another question from uh, Rupert Lipton. So my, my question relates to the fact that um, I think post COVID, there are going to be a whole raft of new disputes, particularly in the field of force majeure and frustration of contract. And how do we persuade uh, Africans and particularly African businesses to turn away from what is often a, a knee-jerk reaction of going to the courts and instead seek to negotiate solutions to disputes uh, with a mediator where, where necessary. Um, and particularly considering that in the case of force majeure and uh, frustration uh, disputes in the courts, this is going to be new ground, which will often need to go to the highest appeal courts to generate new jurisprudence. And that's uh, time uh, 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 that, that business can't really afford in, as they, the, the world tries to recover from COVID. As you well know, um, force majeure and frustration of purpose um, are doctrines that certainly in the United States, um, courts have not been uh, particularly friendly to. Um, even in the wake of 9-11, for example, and other significant um, um, occurrences, the courts have adjusted um, and given people more time. Um, but those are not going to be doctrines that I suspect um, you will find significantly transforming the landscape of contract law. What I will say within the context of contracts with African firms um, is that there is often a perception that the contracts either um, were already imbalanced and so there's often a resistance to further submitting to mediation or arbitration um, and there is often a dogged insistence on um, the rights and the contract being interpreted. That said, I think because this is a pandemic and this was a situation affecting every country and every, every region, that we will see innovations, um, that lawyers will be talking about ways of either adapting uh, the contracts or nullifying the contracts. Um, and, I, and I think that the opportunities for mediation are going to be much better than arbitration or litigation. Thanks to all of the incredible panelists and the audience. We're sorry we, we don't have more time for this, but I want to emphasize this is the beginning, not the end of the discussion. And this is a critical discussion, not just for lawyers. The last uh, question and answer really was about the incredibly important and complicated legal questions at stake here. But I think uh, we've heard throughout this discussion that uh, there are policy considerations, business considerations, human rights considerations, access uh, to justice, uh, gender equality, national sovereignty, all of these issues uh, are intersecting with issues of law and lawyers. And I hope that this has given you just the beginning of an introduction of why this is such an important topic. Uh, we at the Center on the Legal Profession look forward to continuing this discussion with you in Africa the, as soon as we're able to travel, which I hope will be soon. It's one of my favorite places in the world to go, and I look forward to greeting all of you, I hope, there at various events, and we'll keep you posted on what we're doing. Uh, until then, the slide, which will be available, shows you how you can keep in touch with us and the project that we're doing, whether through our website or we have actually a digital magazine called The Practice where we write about these issues or by contacting uh, us through our fantastic uh, research fellow, Raf Madlate. Thank you all for giving us two of your most precious resources, which is ours in your day to think about these uh, issues. And we look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Teresa, Thank you so much for making this platform and this series possible at this pivotal time uh, in the history of Africa, but really uh, the world. So thank you all very much. And Teresa, I turn it back over to you. I thank everyone for joining us today. I think that David has made it clear that this is the beginning of this conversation around law. And um, we hope to stay in touch with you and for all of the lawyers who have joined us throughout these sessions, thank you. We hope that this session addresses your interests and concerns and we will be back with more in the future. Thank you, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.